during the first couple of years of my relationship with my husband, we had this reoccurring argument. <laughs> and always, at some point during it, I would say, sure, you're gonna leave me anyway. It hurt him, he found it really hard to deal with, and he used to say to me, are we gonna be having this argument when we're 80? Like, can we not just sort this out? I'd then be like, what do you mean when we're 80? Like, you're not gonna be around. And he'd say, Melanie, what if I am around? Are you still not gonna just believe that I love you and I want to be here? And I'd say, right, fine. If there's a situation where you're still around when we're that old, then yeah, I will still feel like this. I'll always feel like this. So you might as well just leave me. <laughs> we get great laughs out of this now, but this was a huge problem not just for me and him, but for me and many other people that I've been involved with. For as long as I can remember, I have been an insecure people pleaser with trust issues, so unbelievably terrified of the uncomfortable sensations brought on by not feeling good enough for someone and by the mere existence of a possibility that someone might leave me. So terrified that I'd self-sabotage, I'd push people away, I'd abandon myself, abandon my own needs in order to not be abandoned. <laughs> like, what I mean by this is just putting other people's needs first, always. I'd perform, you know, the role of the person I thought they wanted that, that they might not leave. And um, I'd disassociate, which I've learned through therapy. I, in my life, I've spent such wild amounts of time re-watching certain films, certain shows that I found comfort in, or like it, there's a familiarity because I know what's gonna happen. So it has this weird soothing effect on my anxiety. But after my Nana died, for example, I watched the trilogy of the Lord of the Rings every within every 24 hours for months the extended editions. This started from a very young age. My mom used to point it out to me, but I'd become so absorbed in a movie or a show or whatever that I'd just become completely unaware of my surroundings. Like I wouldn't hear someone talking to me. And yeah, I've realized that fantasizing and um, creating worlds, like this is great because I write novels, like it helps with that creative pursuit. But yeah, it's always been my safe space. It's been where I escape to, to essentially escape my thoughts. Like, I'm still not the best at just being in silence uh, because there's so much always happening up here. Do tell me if you relate and if you do stick around because this is the video that I promised um, about how I finally overcame a lot of this stuff in order to have finally a secure functioning relationship. And by stuff, I mean the unreasonable jealousy, all the suspicion in romantic relationships and the fear of vulnerability and being seen for who I actually am without all the bells and whistles. The compulsive hypervigilance, you know, just constantly looking out for the danger in people because from a young age, I just started perceiving people as as dangerous, not safe. Constantly just scanning people for like proof that I'm right and that like the worst thing is just about to happen. And yeah, just like the perfectionism and the fear of being alone, the constant need to numb, the attraction to unavailable people. <laughs> We're gonna go there. In my recent video about why I quit alcohol, I told you I could make a video, if you wanted, about shadow work and transactional analysis. These are two of the main things I think that have really helped me through therapy and there was a lot of interest. So yeah, we're gonna do that today. And getting deep today, deep today. But before we go there, I just want to quickly thank today's video sponsor, which is BetterHelp. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P. Um, because yeah, I think they're the perfect video sponsor for this topic. And that's because while I'm gonna tell you what helped me, my shadow work won't be your shadow work and your life scripts in transactional analysis are not my life scripts because we've had different childhoods we've had different parents therapy is the place you go deep with this so it's it's nice to learn about it of course and i hope that this will help you but doing it yourself i could not recommend that enough i have therapy to thank for my marriage my children 
everything in my life, everything good in my life, really, because I had a lot to overcome. So BetterHelp is the world's largest therapy service. They're 100% online, so you can chat to them on your phone, your laptop, at your own convenience. And they have over 30,000 therapists. These are licensed, experienced therapists that can help you with a huge range of issues. If after this video you're interested in delving into your own stuff in therapy with BetterHelp, you can check the link in my description box. To sign up with them, you answer a few questions and that will help them to understand your needs and preferences for therapy and then they can assign you to the therapist that they think will best suit you and if that therapist isn't right for you for whatever reason you can swap therapists at no additional charge which is amazing so if you want to do the therapy and you want more schedule flexibility and you would like someone custom picked for you I really recommend BetterHelp. Same professionalism, more affordable. And yeah, my link as always will get you 10% off your first month. So, right, signs you have abandonment issues. Oh yeah, I wanted to show you this, I forgot. Pop that there, but yeah, this is the show up for yourself journal. It's so beautiful. My friend Carla launched these and I linked them down below because there's some other colors, but this is my current shadow work journal. Um, so I'm not just gonna show you the start, but you can see there, it's just plain paper, hand bound with Italian linen. There's just something about writing things down and I love that little message on the front of this journal. Just It just gets me every time when I know it's time to do the work. We all must do the work, but such a pain in the arse. <laughs> so abandonment issues, what are those? What are those? Just like an overwhelming fear of losing loved ones. Fear of abandonment basically makes you think and behave in ways that makes building healthy relationships really challenging. It'll typically arise in childhood. So there might have been a traumatic event. There might be a lot of repressed trauma there, like you might have witnessed a lot of unhealthy behaviours in adult relationships that you were around a lot. And you might not have conscious memory of this, but it doesn't mean that your body doesn't hang on to the, those memories. And like, yeah, those early years, that's in our cells, it's in our bones, it it is what shapes us and our early years experiences become a huge part of who we are. This is all very triggering for me as a mother to small kids, um, you know, because it's always on my mind that I, I just don't want to get anything wrong. But that's a topic for another video. Anyway, my, my parents divorced, right, when I was, I think I was seven, but, you know, things were very ropey for a year or so before that from my memory. I said in a recent video that I'm really glad my parents divorced. When two people don't work together, it's like a ring. You can love a ring, think it's beautiful, and if it doesn't fit your finger, no amount of shoving it on is gonna make it fit, you know? So some people just are not, it just doesn't work. Anyway, the fact that my dad was a massive presence in my life, he was one of my primary caregivers, and suddenly he was gone, most of the time. I, there was a long period where we only saw him twice a month and then when he would have us he worked night shifts so he spent a lot of time trying to like nap and recover because he was so wrecked all the time. Um, so we, I kind of remember seeing him very little even though he tried to spend as much time with us as we could but yeah a divorce although it might be in the best interest of of the children, depending on the specific situation, it can have lasting effects and it, it, it doesn't mean you shouldn't divorce, you know, out of fear of ruining your children. Like, it's sometimes it's gotta happen. Same way, sometimes mama gotta be out of the house at work and kids will be with child mind, minders. There's a lot of research now showing that inconsistency in these attachments and kind of when you're so young that you don't really understand why that person isn't around, you don't understand the context, you don't understand the ins and outs, you internalise, you can internalise and feel like it's somehow your fault and like you're not good enough, like your parents, they're there, they're not there, they're there, they're not there. It just gives you this feeling that People aren't safe. Even the people that you love the most are not safe. This can lead people to grow up living in a constant 
state of kind of hyper vigilance. That is a trauma response that plays out and can, can play out in friendships, romantic relationships, family relationships. And that constant looking out for danger and expecting danger, it's a compulsive reflex from, from your childhood. Some people who are afraid of, of abandonment, they just won't even let people in in case they get hurt or in case the person leaves them. Their kind of way to give that protective bubble around themselves is to just keep distance and that's like a, a protective force field. I've never been that kind of avoidant attachment style. I've always been more the anxious attachment style where my way of kind of combating this and surviving it really, it's like, it's just how you learn to survive in the world is to just constantly want to be on people's good sides and to want to just please people. And you constantly, like for me, I've, I've always just needed and wanted reassurance that they're happy with me and that I'm not inadequate. <laughs> so dating really triggered my fears of abandonment, you know, from when I was like 16, 15, 16, whatever. Um, and we are hardwired to recreate certain childhood experiences for comfort and familiarity, not only in relationships, but people do kind of tend to be attracted to the same kind of dynamics that they saw growing up. Anyway, all this started rearing its head when I had my first kind of long-term series, like the first time I was really in love, I was 16. Six months in to this relationship, I'll never forget this. Such, this is just like an example from my life, okay? We were walking home from school holding hands and one of his best friends was with us and we did this you know every day and I was just crazy about this boy and I remember we were at the side of a main road just like crossing the road and there's me in my head like babies married like I I'm 16 but I was so infatuated and in love and just besotted and I was very clingy I was a very needy girlfriend and I was probably already behaving in a way that was actually bringing about what I didn't want, which is what a lot of us can do with this problem. And I remember him saying to me like, my parents told me that we have to go on a break because they want me to focus on my exams for school and you know, this relationship is distracting and, and, and whatever. And he just, he said it like he was telling me the weather. And I never, <laughs> it was like, a, a stab through the heart, it was so painful. All these things build up over the years and we collect them and it makes us, it makes the fears worse and worse because the sensations are like, that was the most uncomfortable, painful thing. Unavailable people, that can become a pattern. And then when someone is emotionally available, you can't even trust it. Like I had another long-term relationship and this person was very there and very committed and stuff. But I just remember even still like constantly not feeling good enough. I would see pictures of the kinds of girls that he found attractive, you know, whether they be actresses or other girls in our town or girls in magazines, exes, whatever, his, his type. I didn't feel like that was, it was me, you know, he liked very, petite, slim, long dark hair and um, yeah when we got together I was quite chubby and I had like a short little bob with a fringe and anyway I remember doing everything I could to just try and look like the pictures of, of girls that he would be like oh she like she's so beautiful. I became so small and um, I developed food issues, massive body image issues and even when I changed so much physically I couldn't even tell in the mirror like I couldn't see it like I, I never felt like enough that was not his fault that was that was my issues you know with that relationship as well even though we didn't work and I was unhappy in in the pairing I couldn't listen to my intuition and my inner voice about it and I couldn't leave because the people pleaser in me and the person who is so afraid of abandonment. I chose to stay in a bad situation way past its expiry date out, out of the fears of, of, yeah, of those sensations. So 
when that relationship ended, you know, I'm in my mid-twenties and I start having these like kind of micro relationships. I would act so detached because I was so, I was so afraid of rejection and I would, yeah, push people away. I'd pretend I was indifferent in situations where I absolutely wasn't. And moving on too quickly, and I've done this a few times, like after a very long relationship of five or six years, I jumped right into something else. And then after that, I jumped right into something else. And again, after that, I jumped right into something else. And doing that, if you do that, it's, it's not good because you're not then dealing with any of these emotions. You're not confronting the real issues. It's just like constant distraction from yourself, really. And um, yeah, I took a break, had a patch of being single, couple years. And when my now husband came along and everything about that relationship just, it fit, you know, he was very quickly my home. And I just, I knew in the pit of my stomach that if I lost him, it would, it would destroy, it would destroy me. That's just, you know, how I felt, even though I knew by this point that like I could survive um, a breakup and something not working out and I was happy by myself and I, you know, it, but this, it's just, you know, how you feel when you're falling in love. Anyway, but I didn't want to, I didn't want to entertain those feelings. So instead I tried really hard to just act not that attached to him and to push him away and to almost, even when he, we had ended up in a committed relationship, it's like I was pushing him to his limits to just see, after this big fight, then you're gonna leave me, right? Once you see me when I'm really unwell, once you see me when I don't look so great, once you see me when I'm really extremely drunk and going through a lot of mental health issues related to my family, like, then you'll leave me. And I was, I, I was just waiting for, um, for him to, you know, leave. I was so scared to even talk about him online in case things didn't work out. And then when I did post about him, I remember constantly going through my head like, oh, when he leaves me, how am I gonna live through having to tell everyone, oh, we've broken up actually. Like, the, it, was, it was exhausting. I feel like my attachment style has actually shifted. And in my marriage, I have a secure attachment. And it's so amazing experiencing that. It's important to say that my husband has a very secure attachment style. If he was avoidant, we wouldn't have made it past the first two years. If he was anxious like me, we probably would have been a nightmare. But if I didn't work on my issues and become securely attached, he'd have left me, I think, because like, he wanted a healthy relationship and he deserved that. And this is the beautiful thing about love. It can help people grow and help them reach their full potential. It can help people iron out their bullshit. What, what I'm saying is, if you have attachment issues, you need to end the pattern of going for other people who also have attachment issues. If you choose someone who is securely attached, they can extend a hand and help pull you out of the hole. But it's your job then to learn to stop falling back in there. I'm gonna break down shadow work and I'm gonna break down transactional analysis. Um, but a few things that I took away from therapy as well. This is huge and you can just do this now. Um, so like learning to tolerate feelings of distress by exposure to those feelings, it really showed me that my thoughts don't always line up with reality. Really helps with decoupling yourself from another person and what they think of you or whether or not they want you. A very straightforward example of this is if you are dating right now and anytime you go on a good date, you you want to know how the person feels about you when they next want to see you and then you don't hear from them like for, you know, a few days and you spend those entire few days just like a ball of anxiety and um fear and you're anticipating these uncomfortable feelings rising up in you when you realize like, oh, actually, they don't want me. If they don't 
text you to arrange another date. The world's not going to end. You're not going to combust. So that's a good opportunity to really sit with that horrible feeling and expose yourself to it. Lie down on the floor. <laughs> Play a bit of relaxing music in the background. Firstly, just let the feelings wash over you. You feel uncomfortable. You might feel a bit, a bit paralyzed, dysregulated. Come out of your head and connect with all the feelings in your body, your hands, your feet. If you're lying on a carpet, what does that feel like? This is the here and now, so what you'd be feeling while doing this. This is the world, this is real, this, this is all there is right now. And everything that's happening up here, that does not have to run you. Therapy also really taught me that, like, there's, there's never a guarantee that someone won't hurt us. Um, but living in a constant state of fear about something that probably won't happen but might happen. I think this quote might be from Fantastic Beasts, but I love this quote that if you worry, you suffer twice. When something happens that you're dreading or you, you think that it might happen, you can handle it, you can take it. What you can't handle is the constant worrying that it might happen and also worrying that it might happen and that then affecting how you act might make it happen. So just stop it. <laughs> like Self-compassion, grounding techniques, breathing exercises, all these things are very helpful. Um, they are. There's, there's a lot in this. So let's talk shadow work. When I get a chance, I dip into this journal and I spill my soul. Through shadow work, we're looking to uncover the repressed, icky, sticky parts of ourselves we, we don't like, the parts of ourselves that we hide from ourselves. It might be parts of your personality that you yourself don't like um, in, in yourself or other people. It might be trauma. So I'm reading this for you. Jung explained that the shadow is a cognitive blind spot of our psyche, an undercurrent of who we are that we're completely unaware of. It's an element of our own nature that exists in our own conscious and is made from our repressed desire, ideas, instincts, weaknesses and shortcomings. After the incident where I quit alcohol, which I shared, link, linked down below, what my therapist wanted me to do was to take my shadow, to look at it, to learn about it, to integrate it. And um, the story of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, it, that's a great example. My fear of abandonment and like this, it's, it's like this scared, misshapen, ugly aspect of my nature. And it brings me shame. I don't like people seeing it. I don't want to look at it. Think of something that you've done or that you've said and you've been like, why did I do that? Or like, what was wrong with me? Or you've just really judged yourself harshly and maybe rightly so. <laughs> like if it was something that you wouldn't normally do or say, that right there, that's part of your shadow, sticking its monkey little claw out and going, hello. Mm. Carl Jung said, there is no generally effective technique for assimilating the shadow. It is more like diplomacy or statesmanship and it is always an individual matter. First, one has to accept and take seriously the existence of the shadow. Second, one has to become aware of its qualities and intentions. This happens through conscientious attention to moods, fantasies and impulses. Third, a long process of negotiation is unavoidable. And yeah, this is where I negotiate with my shadow. What the negotiation means is like going back and forth between accepting your shadow and pushing it away, figuring out what is useful and you know, what, what is it doing and why and what can you take from that? What will help you? What do you need to get control over? Journaling and self-reflection is massive here. Like there's often so much going on in your head and life is really busy, you know, and if you're not kind of putting it down on pen and paper, it's just hard to look at it. We just, we don't grow if we don't look at the stuff about ourselves that we dislike. And it, some people might just look to judging other people instead of dealing with their own stuff. And, you know, I think a lot of us can do that. Like sometimes I'll catch myself in my head 
judging people and it it's because I'm judging myself like I'm I'm projecting when I do that and that is why most of the time anyway you shouldn't take it personally if you feel like other people are judging you because so much more of it is about them a lot of honesty is needed if you're going to do shadow work it's very hard to be extremely honest with yourself um and your therapist but mostly with yourself and to look at those parts of your shadow self that you just would rather not acknowledge and would rather you'd rather pretend that that's not who you are um everyone has this shadow side everyone does and when you discover awful aspects of yourself have a negative self talk doesn't help that so you you have to manage your self-talk, your inner dialogue, because that can have a big impact on how you react externally. So you might have thoughts, feelings here, shadow self, and then this is you and what you do and what, how you act, how you treat other people. Awful, uncomfortable feelings can exist without you having to take them out on other people. And, you know, for me, that involves not pushing my husband away, not trying to people please. One thing I'm practicing at the moment, which is so hard for me, is just saying no when I want to say no. Like someone that I really love and want to see is around and for the weekend and they want to go get coffee and I haven't seen them in six months. And I just don't want to because I am exhausted. I'm getting over virus. My kids have been unwell. We've all been losing sleep in the house. Like we've all the house renovations going on. I've got all my contracts coming up to Christmas. My husband's working like mad. When I have a chance, I just want to nap. I just want to sleep. And um, I will get that message and be like, do you want to go for coffee on Saturday? I want to say no, but I also don't want... I care more about how the person is going to perceive my no than about my needs to just rest, you know? Yeah, I'm practicing just not making an excuse or trying to justify anything, just being like, it's been a really tough week. Can we do it another time? That's very hard for me, even age 34. So transactional analysis, this combined with shadow work, these two things have changed my life so much and have massively positively affected my marriage. Transactional analysis, TA, a lot of people use TA for short, it's a tool, an amazing tool for understanding human relationships and for changing your relationships. The way my therapist explained it to me, we all each have these three states and we can bounce between them in, in, in any given day and in certain relationships we might kind of default into so right there's the parent ego state the adult ego state and the child ego state the parent ego state relates to your own past experiences of parental figures and you've got your critical parent think rules demands control and you've got your nurturing parent so think support protection care um your inner child is your child ego say like your childhood experience that's going to be so unique to you but um, just think of your inner child. So that's your child ego state. Then you've got adult. And the way my therapist put it was that adult ego state is like how you show up in a work situation. So a meeting um, with your boss, a work phone call, any kind of professional setting like that, you know, the way you might be in university with your teacher. So that's the adult and think here, assertive, rational, practical. When you're in adult mode, you're all about right here, right now. It's not like got all of your messy past pulled into it. Like that's not running how you're reacting and talking and responding. And what transactional analysis therapy helps you to do is to strengthen and integrate your adult ego state. So kind of trying to always come back to adults when you find yourself 
slipping into child or parent and then that in that situation is leading you into just a really dysfunctional situation social situation and just an awful conversation what you do in therapy and it's so interesting and helpful to do this is you and your therapist together will come up with a, a transaction a hypothetical one or even like an example one from your real life that commonly occurs say a kind of recurring conversation you might have with your mother or your husband and then your therapist will identify the ego states present based on like they'll ask you a bunch of questions about what does this person say and how does this person say it they'll pinpoint patterns we can fall into just a really toxic dysfunctional relationship with someone and a lot of the time it's because one is in parent mode one is in child mode and that's not complementary in in an adult relationship this is a type of psychotherapy and it's it's so effective i cannot tell you this helps me every single day because in my mind i'm always thinking about you know different times i've been sat with people that i'm doing a job with and how how do i show up in those conversations and if they say something a certain way how do i actually choose to respond now when you're with someone you're really comfortable and safe with you might feel um like it's more comfortable to like let those inner ego states out but this can cause conflict like if, if you are in child mode your husband is in child mode a decision might not be made parent mode parent mode you and your husband will both want your own way and just won't you just won't come to any kind of decent compromise so like the ideal scenario my therapist told me anyway is adult adult and sometimes that's not possible like if you're dealing with a certain type of person and it's like a cross transaction so like parent child if you want that to be positive and be able to enhance the communication and have a healthy relationship healthy dynamic one or both of you has to shift perspectives to achieve that so if you and your parent are in parent child mode one of you has to come to adult and what you don't have control over is the other person you do have control over yourself. So this was the biggest breakthrough for me ever. And it has made me be able to deal with certain situations and relationships in such a better way. And like, I know now that no interpersonal situation is ever going to cause me, me to have any kind of explosive, anxious, terrified volcanic eruption like that's never going to come from me because i am able to you know get back to my adult state even if the other person is you know blah, 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 and that's triggering me or whatever so this transactional analysis and shadow work they've both given me such a deep understanding of myself my behavior in certain past situations and my feelings and it's just really nice to get to know yourself um, and I know like all my work is not done this is an ongoing thing it's not something you can just you know couple sessions of therapy done forever like I, I don't see it that way at all and I do think that some of us depending on our level of baggage the weight of our baggage if you will um, some of us will just need intermittent therapy forever possibly and that's okay because with the right support and with the right techniques you can live a very healthy life and you can have a healthier attachment style and I do get at times very envious and al almost resentful hello shadow <laughs> but you know of, of people who grow grow up with that and don't have all this nonsense to have to unpack. But it is what it is. There's no point being eaten up by resentment and, and, and all that. Because what can you do today to address your shit? Is what I'm saying. Um, so that's just my little dip in the toe in to these topics because I just think more people need to know about these things. You know, I'm not a therapist, but like I would, I, sometimes I just think if I do a master's, which I intend to before I'm 50, ideally before I'm 40, but we'll, we'll see. Sometimes I think 
therapy is my calling. I am absolutely fascinated with this stuff and just with like realizing our potential and growing and developing, becoming more self-aware. Yeah, I get all these urges to just like have live streams where we, you know, we, we do exercises together and all this and I just, I'm not qualified, um, but I can at least share what works for me. And I'm, I'm very blessed, I'm very lucky to have a platform where I can do that. So yeah, I hope this video gave you something. And thanks, BetterHelp, for sponsoring me. Um, um, we're, we're a long time into these weird video endings now. They've been going on for quite some time. It's been months. And more and more of you are reaching the end of my videos and, and talking to me about how you feel about these weird video endings. So today, we're gonna end with teabag, teabag face. Teabag, teabag face. Yeah! <laughs>